George Hegel's Psychology from Hegel as the National Philosopher of Germany, published in 1874 by Dr. Karl Rosenkrantz, 1805 to 1879, translated by Granville Stanley Hall, 1846 to 1924. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The presupposition for Hegel's philosophy of right, of the state, and of history was not, as is commonly said, his logic alone, but no less his psychology. Since Locke's philosophy, psychology has become properly a central science, to which investigation was directed with special predilection, and proceeding from which it was attempted to ground the other sciences, ethics, ascetics, and religious doctrine. In this, the Germans had accomplished no less significant results than the English and the French. With Kant's critique of pure reason, the conception of consciousness advanced so far into the foreground as entirely to absorb psychology. Kant left behind him an anthropology, which was an ingenious and elegant discourse on the principal elements of psychology. His scientifically established psychology will ever be sought in the transcendental ascetics and the logic of his critique of reason, especially in the chapter on the deduction of categories. Fichte had no psychology outside of the science of knowledge, shelling none outside of his transcendental idealism. Herbart, again, had psychology because he replaced the ego as the subject, which maintains itself by notions, or stolengem, since he regarded these as psychic quanta, which are related to one another with an external independence. His psychology became therefore essentially a theory of the mechanism of notions, which made the spontaneity of the ego illusory. Hegel apprehended psychology from a higher principle, which distinguished his philosophy from all others, from the idea of spirit. He distinguished one, the subjective, two, the objective, three, the absolute mind, and thus brought light into a region which had been desolated by the most extreme confusion. Under the first designation, he understood the individual mind which he developed from its naturalness to formal freedom. Under the second, mind, as it determines itself in its action by the idea of good. Under the third, mind as in art, religion, and science. It elevates itself to intuition, to feeling, and to the conception of the absolute. The conception of subjective mind, again, Hegel distinguished in three special moments. One, that of the soul. Two, that of consciousness. Three, that of mind. As special sciences, he named them respectively anthropology, phenomenology, and psychology. This latter designation, I think, he would have done better to omit, since the name psychology had already come into use for all which he comprised in the doctrine of subjective mind. It must remain the general name, and Hegel might quite properly have called the third part pneumatology, a name of which earlier metaphysics had made use. Under this term, Hegel understood the entire sphere of the unconscious in man as far as it was still determined by nature immediately as mind. It is the passive side of man, so far as it appears in its natural qualities, changes, and in the conflict of the soul with its corporeity, in order to make it the symbolic expression of its interior or content. One should contemplate the confusion with which, before Hegel, the conception of race, temperament, talent, sex, periods of age, sleep and waking, dreaming, custom, mimicry, etc., 
had been casually treated in order to realize the immeasurable progress he has made here here as in ethics he causes to be conceived a still more strict ordination a still more interior concatenation of determinations than he has presented but the credit of laying the foundation for this connected treatment must remain with him the chief difficulty in human psychology lies in correctly apprehending thought in its unity as well as in its distinction from sensation the animal cannot pass beyond sensation while with man thought constitutes the active principle from the very first and even in his sensations apparently he sets out empirically from sensation but essentially he bears himself even in sensation as an intrinsically rational subject the animal as sentient remains in individuality man exalts himself from the individual to the universal we call thought so far as it is opposed to sensation consciousness consciousness however does not arise at first successively but is originally present in man as his thinking relation to himself immediately man does not yet know that he thinks original consciousness is unconsciousness the ego already exists in itself on sich but not for itself hence consciousness within the sphere of the unconscious can be apprehended only as a self still in its natural state sleeping and waking etc are natural changes contrasted conditions the human state of wakefulness is distinguished from that of animals by the fact that man comes into relation not only to sensuous objectivity but that he also distinguishes himself for himself from his relation it may be contested where the conception of waking should be treated but in this case we must not be confused but must hold fast to the principle it is for this reason that the dream belongs to the sphere of the unconscious although it presupposes the formation of notions and of intuitions while we dream the free distinction of self as subject from objectivity does not occur the condition of dreaming is sleep sleep is however an act of natural vitality for example of a natural process which is independent of thought lunacy is likewise a decadence into unconsciousness the lunatic has a formal consciousness but he is involved in a condition of unconsciousness so far as concerns his crazy notions with respect to these he is not free like the dreamer with respect to the images which hover past in his chaotic soul when the lunatic is freed from his illusion this return to free subjectivity is analogous to awaking from a dream the condition of daydreaming as well as that of somnambulism must be placed in the category of unconsciousness although their mediation may belong to much higher spheres hegel treated the conception of consciousness under the name of phenomenology it constitutes the antithesis of anthropology for in this all determinations are necessary are posited by nature while with consciousness the freedom of thought arises as in itself infinite self-determination as subjectivity which makes as its object its own entire psychic individuality with all its qualities changes and conditions as moments of phenomenology hegel distinguished one consciousness two self-consciousness three rational self-consciousness subject distinguishes itself first from others secondly from itself thirdly from the universal conception which it finds as the identical bond between its outer and inner world reason is the identical essence as well as objectivity in itself as of subjectivity in itself 
unquestionably this course is a process of knowledge but very different from that which he presented later under the name of theoretical intelligence for consciousness recourse must ever be had to the antithesis of subject and object the object is either given in existence external to me which i seek to know according to its truth or i make myself an object but find objects outside of myself which like me are subjects for themselves or finally i find the conception of reason the necessity of which is the same without as within me in his development hegel organically integrated the great achievement of kant and fichte in finding the conception of consciousness for science by so doing however he aroused the greatest opposition philosophy had again given up the doctrine of consciousness and had again fused it with that of theoretical intelligence just as even so strict a hegelian as michelet seeks to be had done but here also we must submit to the consequences of the principle the antithesis of natural psychic individuality is subjectivity as which thinking yet inseparate from will distinguishes itself from itself as ego that which in the third part of his science of subjective mind hegel calls especially mind is a conception which transcends that of the rational self-consciousness by virtue of the fact that the subject as rational becomes content no less than form as individuality it bears a passive relation to be as it were a genius the individual must become self-complacent as subjectivity it is essentially actuosity consciousness itself posits the difference as well as the unity of subject and object but it is still dependent upon that which is presented as its object and does not itself produce the categories of reason though it explores the entire world without and within self knowledge of these is what it produces the subject in itself is truly free only when it produces itself in both form and content freedom holds the antithesis of theoretical and practical in itself the theoretical is the condition of the practical in the same way that individuality is the condition of subjectivity or that this latter is the condition of spirituality in the treatment of theoretical intelligence hegel distinguished one intuition Antoine, two imagination Vorstellen, three thought mind as immediate substance is feeling which as the proper content of mind is progressively formed through it from intuition yet involved in space and time to pure thought the content is the same through all the different steps of intuition imagination and thinking but i change its form and thereby give myself another relation to it i intuit for example the sun as a luminous round body it becomes night and i see it no longer but i have a mental image of it within myself by this image i have freed myself from the externality of the phenomenon the image as a purely ideal object is absolutely fluid i can bring it into relation with a thousand other objects it is also general i can subsume other similar bodies under the notion sun but necessity is wanting when i add this to generality i change imagination to thought the sun is the central body of a planetary system with this apprehension these relations which i can arbitrarily give to the notion of a sun cease and necessary relations take their place nothing is more frequent in the ordinary psychology and logic than the confusion of intuition imagination and thought because they cohere most closely in fact 
it remains an immortal service of hegel's that he has elucidated their difference upon the foundation which kant's critique of reason afforded the first and exhaustive discussion of his doctrine is found in karl dobbs anthropology but it is as though this labor had never been performed there is also a presentation of the entire doctrine of the subjective mind by hegel himself which is generally entirely ignored when after his death his entire works were published dr Bullman undertook to add a commentary from hegel's lectures on the corresponding topics to the short paragraphs of the encyclopedia which he very admirably executed here hegel entered very intelligibly into all the difficult points of his systematology he showed in how extended a way he was familiar with the empirical material in the expression of psychic phenomena he evinced himself an ingenious soul painter whom the most delicate shadings of his object did not escape this he did especially in his delineations of the diseases of the soul of somnambulism custom temperament etc among the numerous dissensions of psychologists two points have become generally prominent since hegel's death which we will briefly mention one is the conception of attention the other that of language to attend is according to hegel the act by which the mind distinguishes a content which is present to it as sentient from itself and from other content in itself the condition for this act is therefore that i am subject that i distinguish myself as ego from myself and thereby from all which immediately i am not he presupposes consciousness so long as i exist only as sentient i cease to exist in the specialty of that which i feel but because i am subject i can distinguish myself from myself as a sentient individual i can direct myself in free self-determination to my immediate being this spontaneous direction is attention sensuous certainty and apprehension are moments of this act through it i make my feelings an object for myself i strip off from its content the external time and space conditions wherein i find it i transfer it into the ideal space and the ideal time of consciousness by so doing i make it an intuition which as being in me and remembered by me becomes a mental image the animal is also attentive but only as a sentient individual it remains dependent upon sensuousness there exists a movement of sensation but not a free activity of self-determination the animal cannot form its sensations into intuitions and since intuition again is a condition of representation it can still less reach the latter the animal cannot make its conditions present to itself when a man says he feels that it is warm he has already advanced beyond feeling although it still exists in him as a condition the word intuition is of course derived originally from the sense of sight though it has acquired a general significance for that content which is projected from feeling into consciousness the expression representation is correct in so far as it is intuition which is reproduced by the subject in and from itself representation is free from the connection which intuition bears to feeling it makes the content of intuition independent of a free image from which all that is casual and unessential in the original genesis is omitted representations for example stream wood animal anger command etc are general every representation as such is different from every other but the representing subject distinguishes itself also from its representations and is free from them since they attain existence only through his own activity 
when a subject ceases to hold the power over its representations it either becomes lunatic or it dreams that which the school of herbart has elaborated as a mechanism of representation into an extended dynamics and statics of representation in the intelligible tract of consciousness is essentially a psychological disguise of the laws of thought we can cast heterogeneous representations promiscuously together as for example in reading books for children in order to exercise them on the particular letter bridge book buck blood ball etc occur promiscuously but when we arrange our conceptions we do it according to logical laws language originates according to hegel from the incitement which we feel at the moment in which we wish to express a conception to make a sound as its sign if we had no organs of speech we should of course be able to produce no word in this respect there exists between our mind and organism a teleological connection Without thinking, we should only express feelings by inarticulate sounds, like animals. Deaf mutes can, of themselves alone, advance only as far as notions, but since they can have no idea of sound, they remain dumb and can furnish themselves with a language only by the indirect method of writing. As soon as a child endowed with perfect senses begins to form notions, it begins to take pleasure in words. When we say that language is produced without consciousness, we mean to designate merely the unintentionality of the form, of the sound, and of the grammatical organization. This latter is an actual proof that the language-forming mind is rational in itself. Language is the renaissance of notions in phonetic forms, which are the peculiar product of mind. The reproduction of the notion as such without reference to the sound which custom has fixed to it among a given people we call recollection or reminiscentia recordatio. Recollection in the form of words is memory. Language, on the one hand, is the product of the thought which is latent in its construction. On the other hand, it is the condition of its development now also it becomes clear how much the self-formation of thought in the construction of conceptions in the passing of judgments and in drawing conclusions is distinguished from those forms which it possesses as consciousness for example as relation of subject and object there exists no psychology except the hegelian which so well develops the interconnection of the forms of the theoretical intelligence the origin of language the consequent process of the transformation of knowledge from step to step the practical relationship of mind proceeds also from feeling as impulse but is mediated especially by difference of theoretical relation it is indeed very pleasant to speak only of will and of representation as schopenhauer's philosophy does without actually deducing its idea so that instinct appetite desire passion and will are thrown promiscuously together but for the critical inspection of science a process so full of confusion cannot succeed such expressions as desires will etc admit a very indeterminate usage but science it should be said exists precisely in order to determine their usage more accurately without thereby destroying their current identity hegel assigned also to eudemonism its systematic position in his psychology and thus freed ethics from all those errors which arise when it is confounded with the idea of good instinct propensity appetite desire passion comes to an end in attaining satisfaction it is agreeable to the subject but the enjoyment of this happiness is quite relative 
the manifoldness of natural individuality modifies the kind and manner of satisfaction unlimitedly the composition of the means of enjoyment opens in another direction a new infinity of qualitative and quantitative differences which by the opinion of men by popular prejudice and by fashion are modified again without limit that which was at first felt to be pleasure is converted by excess into its opposite or is degraded to something quite indifferent here is never firm ground for ethics schopenhauer has made a great impression upon his contemporaries by choosing the words of goethe's faust thus i reel from desire to gratification and in gratification i pine for desire as the text of his gospel of pessimism the thinking man who by his intellect knows the torment to which will of nature condemns all that has life can only have the profoundest pity for that which he attempts to make the principle of ethics but pity is also an entirely relative feeling for it depends partly upon the notion which i form of the wretched condition of myself or of another and partly upon the degree in which this notion is developed here also is nothing but relativity eudemonism demands continuous pleasure there must be no pain here hegel adopted all the rigorism of kant in regarding happiness as an element out of which for ethics a motivation but no principle of action could arise the difference of desires inclinations and passions compels man to reflect as to which of them he shall yield the precedence of satisfaction the eudemonist is constrained to moderation in order to compute for his well-being the correct total well-being must however be subordinated to good the idea of which alone is adequate to stand for the thinking man as the principle of ethics with hegel eudemonism is not represented as a mere illusion as imposture as it is by schopenhauer well-being with its pleasure and displeasure should have no other justification than is permitted it by the idea of good hegel's philosophy may be regarded as the interpretation of another passage of goethe's faust who at the close of his experiences sums them up in the result they alone deserve life and freedom who are daily obliged to conquer it end of george hegel's psychology from hegel as the national philosopher of germany by karl rosenkrantz translated from the german by granville stanley hall published in eighteen seventy four